Well, thank you again for the warmth of your welcome. And it's lovely to see you. I, I can see tonight I'm not like the bishop who turned up at a little country church and as he was climbing up into the pulpit, he noticed there were only three elderly people in the audience. And he said to the local minister, he said, did you tell them I was coming? He said, no, but word does seem to have got around. <laughs> so we're not like that tonight. Now, I've been asked to talk to you for a while on a very major topic and a very important topic. The title I've been given is Points of Origin. And interest in origins is vastly important for a very, very simple reason. It's that a person without a past is a person without an identity. When people get amnesia and forget their past, they lose a sense of their identity. And as I travel around the world, I notice that each of us is searching for a bigger story into which we can fit our lives. We have our own story, it's very important. But how does it fit into the rest of the universe? That's why, of course, documentary films like those of Brian Cox and others on television about the history of the universe and of humanity are enormously popular. It's why our bookshops are filled to bursting about stories of the origin of the cosmos because there is a restless search in the human mind and intellect and heart for meaning. And the bigger the story we can fit our lives into, the more meaning we discover in them. Now there's competition, very strong competition for the big story in our culture in the West and particularly in the UK here. The dominant view is that there isn't a big story with any ultimate meaning. There is a group of world views, three in the main. There are not so very many to choose from when you think about it. One big story is that this universe goes back ultimately to mass and energy and nothing else. There is no transcendence, there's no God. So that everything must be explained bottom up in terms of physics and chemistry and nothing more. That's the story we call naturalism or materialism is a, a more stronger refinement of it. On the other side there is theism. That is the belief that there is a God who created the universe and upholds it. And I stand within that family of worldviews as a Christian theist. The only real alternative is to regard the universe and ultimate reality, if you call it God, as one. And there is the worldview of pantheism. So, there is an attempt to capture our minds in this country, at least in the UK, and to move them towards materialism. And the documentary films I mentioned, and the statements of people like Stephen Hawking, who are immensely gifted scientists, are geared to getting the public to believe that science has come to the conclusion that there is no God. So we are ultimately in a meaningless universe. I think they are wrong. I think that what they're doing is abusing science. But I'm very aware as a scientist that science has, rightly, a considerable cultural authority. We're all grateful to the technologies that have put all kinds of iPhones in our pocket. And if I bore you to tears, the tweeting will start <laughs> at a colossal extent, I've noticed. So we're grateful for that. But it's important, I think, to come back and realize that a lot of what is being said about the biblical big story is mythological. Not that the story is mythological, what's being said about it is false and highly misleading. And so I want to begin to talk about this ancient story that begins the Bible in the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis is foundational for our understanding of the biblical worldview. It gives to human beings 
a meta-narrative, a big story into which they can fit their lives. And so I want to start talking about that big story. And I've hinted at it, but now let me say it explicitly. One of the most basic questions anyone can ask is, what is the nature of ultimate reality? You see, everybody sitting in this room has got a worldview. If you're students, it may only be partially formed, and that's true even if you're a bit older. But you wrestle with these big questions. What is the nature of ultimate reality? How am I related to it? Is there life after death? Where is the universe going? Can my life have any significance? Where do we get morality from? All those kind of questions. And the claim of scripture is that the ultimate reality is God. And the majestic words that start our Bible, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. That statement challenges the naturalistic worldview head on. Because it's claiming that there is a God. And God is the cause of the existence of the observable universe. That is a colossal claim to make in 21st century, in the 21st century West. Now you will notice that the Bible starts by asserting there is a God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It doesn't give you any evidence for God, not here. And that's not a weakness, it's a strength. Because as Lewis pointed out long ago, every worldview starts somewhere. You've got to start somewhere. And the biblical worldview starts with God. And then, of course, as you read through the narrative, it piles up the evidence for the existence and involvement of God. Do you remember what Lewis wrote? I believe in God very much as I believe in the sun. Not because I see it, it's dangerous to look directly at the sun, but because in its light I see everything else. And one of the reasons I'm a Christian is that the biblical story not only hangs together, but it cogs into reality. It's a coherent, hanging together story that matches reality as I see it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now please notice what God created. He created the heavens and the earth. That is, he created the whole show. Hebrew as a way of describing things by contrasting opposites, the heavens and the earth. Technically, we call that a merism. And what it really means is God created everything. It's beginning to get across an idea of who God is. Now in the beginning God created is saying that there was a beginning and God was there already because he was the cause of that beginning to space-time or to the universe. Now please notice that what is being emphasized is the fact of creation. In certain parts of the world people get very hung up about other secondary matters to which I will refer briefly, like the timing of creation. But overarching all of that, it's the fact of creation that is utterly basic. Now the text doesn't say that explicitly that the universe was created ex nihilo, as the scholars say, that is out of nothing. There was nothing to create it from. But there are very strong arguments for understanding it this way, as many scholars do. Because if the heavens and the earth stand for everything, and God created everything, then there was nothing before it by definition. So it seems to me the implication of an ex nihilo um, universe is standing there. The second thing is this, that the universe came to exist because God willed it into existence. This is 
a topic that's taken up in the book of Revelation and a very famous statement in chapter 4, verse 11. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed, and they were created. Why do you exist? It's an interesting question to ask, and I bet you've often asked it in quieter hours. Why do you exist? Why does this universe exist? That's not how does it exist, it's why does it exist? Has it a purpose? Now many atheists, of course, will tell you it has no purpose. The Bible has a very different view. It says the universe exists because God wanted it to be. And so do you. That is a magnificent thing. You exist because God wanted you to be. That's one of those statements that imparts to humanity immense dignity. And I'm not only going to be talking about the universe tonight because Genesis addresses in much more detail the origin of humanity. And this overarching statement at the beginning gives us a direction, a sense of motion, which will begin to define what is utterly fundamental to human life. God created because he willed to do it. And in that sense, you cannot second guess God. I recall, I think it was Christmas Eve 1968, that I was watching with many millions of people voices coming from around the moon. And Apollo 8, that spacecraft, I listened with goose pimples, really, to the words read by the astronauts, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And you know, that was advanced technology. I know the computing power that put it up into space was less than you've got in your iPhone. So it was a massive achievement for the time. And yet, the astronauts felt no incompatibility in using the latest technology and beaming the message from space that in the beginning God had created the heavens and the earth. So the first point is God created everything. Is that important? Very important. Because what I discovered today is this, that many people dismiss God for the wrong reasons. There is a fog generating activity going on in our society. And the first major fog is confusion about the nature of God. You see, when I was much younger in the last century, long before any of you existed, and I mentioned God in public, people understood I was speaking about the God of the Bible, the triune God, who revealed himself in Jesus Christ, but that's no longer the case. And I've been puzzled over the past few years, asking myself the question, why is it someone with the intelligence of Stephen Hawking, whom I remember at Cambridge, he's just ahead of me, and he's light years ahead of me in his mathematical ability, but why is it that a man of that intellectual eminence tells us that we've got to choose between God and science? And I suddenly discovered that it was because he's confused about God. He's confused about science, and I'll argue that in a moment or two. But he's actually confused about God. Now let me try and explain that. You see, when many of these people meet someone like me, they think the God I believe in is the so-called God of the gaps. I can't explain it, therefore God did it. In other words, as science advances, it squeezes out any space for God. God, in their view, is like the Greek god of lightning. The Greeks were frightened of lightning, so they postulated a god behind it. If you go to Queens and study physics, the god of lightning will disappear in lecture one, if you learn a bit of atmospheric physics. Because we don't need a god to explain lightning. We know about pressure gradients, we know about electrical discharges, and so on and so forth. 
And Hawking and many others imagine that that's exactly what we believe, that God is the God of the bits of the universe you don't yet understand scientifically, so the more science advances, the less space there is for God. That's the God of the gaps. Now, I want you to try and follow this logic. If you think of God as a God of the gaps, you have to choose between science and God, because that's the way you've defined God. Obviously. If you define God to be the X that explains something until science explains it, then of course you've got to choose between God and science, because that's how you define God. But that's what Genesis gives the lie to. In the beginning, God created the bits of the universe I don't understand. No, he created the whole show. The bits we do understand, the bits we don't. So Genesis is actually answering that objection by filling in the concept of God as the creator of everything. And that's why Isaac Newton, who was a genius, of course, and held the chair that Hawking held until recently, when he discovered his law of gravity, he didn't say there's no God. When Hawking uses the law of gravity, he says because there's a law of gravity, there's no God. What Newton did was, when he discovered the law of gravity, he wrote a brilliant book, the Principia Mathematica, expressing the hope in it that it would persuade thinking people to believe in God. Because you see, Newton, the more he understood of the universe, the more he admired the genius of the God that did it that way. And that's the way we naturally think. The more you know of engineering, the more you could admire the genius of a Rolls or a Royce. The more you understand a painting, the more you can admire the genius of a Rembrandt, not the less. And it's very important to realize what's going on in our culture. The God that is being shot down in the name of science is not the God of the Bible at all. They're not even dealing with the God who created everything. Now that's the first very important thing to realize from Genesis. The second thing to realize is that Genesis is answering the question, why is there something rather than nothing? Now this is a fascinating topic. I mean the topic of nothing. I give lots of lectures on nothing these days because it has become such an important thing. So let me try to explain this to you. In the context of the amazing fact that Genesis has been saying there was a beginning, not for hundreds of years, but thousands of years. But what did science think? Well, until the 1960s, when I was around, they thought there wasn't a beginning. They thought the universe was eternal, because that's what Aristotle taught. And so in the 1960s, and I remember it very well, when evidence began to come in from astronomy and astrophysics, that the universe appeared to be expanding, and then particularly the microwave background seemed to be an echo of some distant past event, and people started to say in the scientific journals, we think we found traces of a beginning to space-time. You won't remember this, but I do. It was resisted fiercely by the United Kingdom scientific establishment. And it went right up to Nature, which is our leading scientific journal. And the editor of Nature, John Maddox at the time, wrote an article saying, we cannot <coughs> accept this new idea that there's a beginning, because if we do, it will give too much leverage to people who believe the Bible. So the major astronomical and astrophysical cosmological advance in the 20th century was resisted because it paralleled the Bible. Isn't that interesting? That's conveniently forgotten by the scientific establishment. Scripture had it right. Now, I must be open with you when I put that to Richard Dawkins. He said, so what's the big deal? Either there was a beginning or there wasn't. Then you've got a 50% chance of guessing whether there was one or not. And I said, Richard, the thing wasn't decided by tossing a coin. It took massive intellectual pressure from the scientific establishment to get people to see that there was a beginning, precisely because they didn't like the biblical view. Now this is vastly important. We're right at ground zero here. We're talking about the fact that there was a beginning. 
how did the Bible get it right? It's an interesting question to ask, isn't it? It got it right. And sometimes people say to me, and it was said to me at a scientific meeting at the highest level not long ago, Professor Lennox, surely you were joking when you suggested the Bible had anything relevant to say to the 21st century. And I said I wasn't joking at all. I said the fact is that the Bible has been declaring clearly that there was a beginning. And science in general didn't believe it until the 1960s. Now I said, if you'd taken the biblical worldview a bit more seriously, you might have looked for evidence of a beginning long before you did, and you might have found it. You see, you can base a prediction based on the biblical worldview. Now, of course, I hasten to add the Bible is not a textbook of science. You don't learn chemistry from it, and you certainly don't learn mathematics from it. But the mistake that many people make is they see it's not a textbook of science, but they forget that at very important points in it, it talks about exactly the same universe that science talks about. There is an overlap. That is, the domains of science and the domains of theology are not entirely separate. And it's that point of intersection, that point of overlap, that we need to pay very close attention to. Why is there something rather than nothing? Now, to follow me, you'll have to realize that what has happened is this. So long as the universe could be regarded as eternal, you didn't have a problem. At least you did have a problem with scripture, because scripture says there was a beginning, and Augustine wrestled with it. And he came to the view that creation meant cause to exist, so that you could use that of God with an eternal universe or a universe that's finite backwards in time. He admitted that the Bible seemed to indicate there was a beginning. But theoretically and philosophically, he had this concept of creation. But you see, we now are in the situation where there is general unanimity among the scientific world that there was a start to space-time and that the universe came from nothing. Now the fun starts. Because, of course, how do you get something from nothing? Well, you can't. You see, the Christian view is not that the universe came from nothing. It was created by God, who's not nothing. But God is not physical. God is spirit. God is real. He's an eternal person who created it out of nothing physical. But if you dismiss God, all you've got is nothing. So the irony of the contemporary discussion is very interesting. We have two alternatives for the origin of the universe. One is God, the other is nothing. There's something beautifully symmetrical about that to me. So what about getting a universe from nothing? How do you do that? Well, by redefining nothing, of course. And here's where the absurdity starts. Let, listen to this now. Here's one of the world's leading astrophysicists talking. Lawrence Krauss. I've debated with him a couple of times. He says, because something is physical, nothing must be physical, especially if you define it as the absence of something. What? <laughs> because something is physical, nothing must be physical, especially if you define it as the absence of something. That's nonsense. Patent nonsense. And when scientists start writing, this is written in his book, A Universe from Nothing, we may be alerted to the fact that something serious is going wrong. You see, getting a universe from nothing has proved so difficult that what they've cleverly done without alerting the public to it is to redefine nothing. Listen to Stephen Hawking the heart of one of his books. This is the main argument. Because there is a law of gravity, this is his reason for dismissing God. Because there is a law of gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Pardon? Because there is a law of gravity, because there is something, the universe will create itself from nothing. Flat contradiction, number one. The universe will create itself. Well, if I say to you, X creates Y, that means roughly if you've got X, you'll get Y, yes? 
If I say X creates X, it means if you've got X, you'll get X. And what does that mean? It means that nonsense remains nonsense, even if Hawking writes it. <laughs> but it's worse than that. That's the second level of contradiction. The third is this. Because there is a law of gravity, he doesn't say because gravity exists. But what would a law of gravity mean if there's no gravity? Laws are meaningless if there's nothing for them to describe. And that opens a window on another huge misunderstanding. The idea that laws can create the world. Peter Atkins is a colleague of mine and a famous atheist at Oxford. And I once asked him after a lecture, I said, Peter, what do you think created the universe? And he said, mathematics. And I was so taken aback, I started to laugh. And Peter was cross. And uh, he said, what are you laughing at? Well, I said, I'm sorry, Peter, but I am a mathematician, and that must be one of the most ridiculous things I've ever heard in my life. He said, why? Well, I said, I'd make it simple for you. One plus one equals two. Did that ever put two pounds in your pocket? We thought, you know, a few years back, that money could be produced by mathematics, didn't we? It's called creative accounting. Have you ever heard of it? <laughs> and the banks nearly went bust. Because mathematics doesn't create anything. This is a basic confusion. Think of Newton's laws of motion that we all love. I hope you do love them. They never moved a billiard ball in the history of the universe. People were accused of that. The laws do nothing. Now here I'm indebted to Lewis, who although he was an arts man, he understood philosophy of science brilliantly. And he points out you can do arithmetic from now to eternity, but it'll never create anything. If you've got one pound and one pound, that'll give you two pounds. But first get your pounds. Arithmetic won't do it for you. That is a fundamental confusion. So here at the heart of Hawking's book, Dismissing God, there is a fundamental statement that's got a triple level, and perhaps more, of contradiction in it. Now here's a challenge for you. If you go home tonight and you can't sleep, try and write a similar sentence on another subject that's got three levels of contradiction in it. You'll find it extremely difficult. Now that I find in a way sad. Because you see, ladies and gentlemen, one of the things I've learned in this debate is this. Not every statement by a scientist is a statement of science. You need to be wary of that. I'm very aware of it tonight because I'm going outside my field of mathematics. Therefore, what's important is I check the logic of the argument very carefully. And I take seriously the best arguments of my opponents. Because not every statement by a scientist is a statement of science. And the statement the universe can create itself from nothing is not a statement by, of science at all. <coughs> but of course, I am fortunate in the kinds of things that I get allowed to do. And one of them was to actually meet and publicly discuss with the father of inflation, Alan Guth, the most brilliant cosmologist in the world at MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So oh, when I had this opportunity, I couldn't resist having a little word with him. And I said, Alan, you know, out there in the public, there is much ado about nothing. People are very confused about nothing. So tell me, when you as a physicist talk about the universe coming from nothing, you do not mean nothing in the sense of which all of us understand it to be. That's absence of anything. He said, no, we do not. I said, thank you very much. And that leads to the most absurd statements, like Krauss saying, nothing is full of potential. What? And you discover that some of them think nothing is a quantum vacuum, but a quantum vacuum isn't nothing. Now, I illustrate that because, you see, the Bible is telling us that you don't get a universe from nothing. You get a universe from God, which makes most sense. Getting it from nothing? See, let me put forward to you the sheer absurdity that's facing us now intellectually. Nothing explains everything, or God explains everything. Well, when it's put as crassly like that, the answer ought to be pretty obvious. And there's a curious, ineluctable logic that's going down that path. It used to be mass energy explains everything. That's materialism. 
But now it's nothing, explains mass energy, so you got down to ground zero, nothing. And you have to decide which of these worldviews makes most sense. And a great deal hangs and depends on it. Now, the New Testament version of Genesis 1 is, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, but it's not actually were made by him. It's much stronger than that. All things came to be through him. And without him, nothing came to be that came to be. It's talking about existence. In the beginning was the word. That is an existence statement. In the beginning, the word already was. The word is eternal. The universe and you came to be. Now, why is that important? Well, it's very important because everywhere I go, one of the questions that comes up all the time is taken straight out of Dawkins' book, and I don't simply get it from university students, I get it from leading professors around the world. If you believe that God created the world, then you have to ask the question, who created God? Have you heard that question before? And who created the creator that created the creator that created the creator? And it goes back forever and ever, amen, and the whole thing is absurd, so let's forget God. It sounds very powerful, doesn't it? It actually isn't any such thing. So let's analyze it. Lewis taught me a bit of logical analysis, you see. Who created God? That's a question. Let me abstract its essence. Who or what created X? Where X is anything you can think of. Now, what does the question ask? It asks for a cause of the existence of X, but it does more than that. It makes an assumption. It says, who created X? What does that tell you about X? It assumes that X was created, of course, doesn't it? If you ask who created God, you're assuming God's created. What if he wasn't? The question doesn't apply. Full stop. The end. It amazes me how many people have been fooled by this statement. You see, let me put it this way. The God delusion. Suppose the title had been The Created God's Delusion. Well, nobody would have ever bought it because we don't need Richard Dawkins to tell us that created gods are a delusion. We usually call them idols, don't we? You see, the question, though it sounds very subtle and clever, does not apply to the God who's revealed in the pages of Scripture who already was. He is eternal. It bypasses the question of God altogether, the God of the Bible. It only applies to a created God. But it's got a big sting in its tail. And I put it to Richard Dawkins. I say, you think this is a sensible question, okay? You believe the universe created you, don't you? Who created your creator? I've waited eight years to get an answer to that. I haven't got it yet. You see, what the question is really about is, what is the ultimate reality? Do the questions go back forever? Of course they don't. For most of my atheist friends, the buck stops with the mass and energy or the multiverse or nothing. For me, the buck stops with God. Those are the two alternative claims to ultimate reality. So you see, the Bible itself is answering Dawkins' question. Indeed, it answers it explicitly. Because in John's Gospel, it doesn't simply say, all things came to be through him. It says, without him, nothing came to be that came to be. Now put in Dawkins' question into that. Dawkins claims God came to be. So what does scripture say? Nothing came to be without him. So if God came to be, he didn't come to be without the word. Who is God? Contradiction. End of story. The Bible anticipates the objection very clearly. You see, ladies and gentlemen, what we read in the Bible is, in one sense, simple, but it is immensely sophisticated. And one of the reasons I'm a Christian is that I've grown to trust it as utterly exact in terms of its intellectual content and its analysis of the big debates even today. We've hardly got beyond the first few words of Scripture. And yet we're using them to analyze the nature of one of the biggest debates on the planet. So here is this 
Genesis account. Now, of course, I know that there's a question in many people's minds, because this is my home country, and I come from Armagh. You've heard of Armagh, haven't you? It's a way up country. But it had a very distinguished archbishop. Do you remember him? Called Archbishop Usher. Do you remember him? And Archbishop Usher, he was largely responsible, and he was a brilliant man, by the way. He's often written off as uh, an ignoramus. He was not. He was a very distinguished scholar. But he came to the conclusion, reading Genesis and the rest of Scripture, that the earth was very young. Now, you notice that as far as I've read in Genesis, it says absolutely nothing about the age of the earth. You'll notice as well that the New Testament says absolutely nothing about the age of the earth. But I'm going to say something about it because I find with many people it's a stumbling block. And it's a stumbling block in two directions. First of all, in the world in which I operate, the secular world, any suggestion that the world is young is effectively to close down any discussion of God and Christianity. Secondly, I meet many Christians, and like me, they are totally convinced of the inspiration and authority of Scripture. And they're puzzled by this kind of question because they don't want to look foolish in the eyes of their teachers and in the eyes of their university professors. They want to hold to scripture, but they don't want to look fools. So what do they do? And my heart goes out to people like that. And I just want to say one thing. I won't answer all your questions, but then there's going to be a Q&A, you see. And the one thing is this. That if we take scripture seriously, we will note that there's a little paragraph at the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was evening and morning, day one. And God said, and there was evening and morning, day two. There's an introductory paragraph of two verses followed by the famous sequence of days. You know about that sequence of days, don't you? It's there. The interesting thing is just looking at it from a grammatical point of view. The first two verses are written in a different tense in Hebrew from the sequence of days. And I've consulted several world-class experts on this who have no axe to grind at all. They point out to me that that means that what is stated at the beginning, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, is detached from the sequence of days. Now that is highly significant because it tells me instantly that actually Genesis says nothing about the age of the earth or the cosmos. It may have something to say about the age of humanity, which is a different thing. But according to the grammar, and this is interesting, I know there will be various opinions about the days in this room. Whatever you believe about the days, the actual text itself detaches the beginning from the days. Day one, in the beginning, didn't occur on day one. It occurs when I don't know. And because I don't know, and because Genesis doesn't say, I'm not prepared to die for an opinion that scripture doesn't say anything about. That's just one way in which carefully reading scripture can help us possibly avoid a totally unnecessary clash. Now you may want to ask me questions about that, and I'm happy to do that, because I want to come back to what is most important before I give you the chance of Q&A. Who is this God that created the heavens and the earth? Is he some force? You know, it's very odd to me, and it's a bit scary. I get people, or I see people, young people, and sometimes older people, who've got a Star Wars concept of God. The Force. Have you heard of the Force? That's very dangerous. Because you see, God is revealed in this chapter is not a force, he's a person. How do I know that? Because there's a whole sequence of verbs connected with them. God saw, God blessed, God said. Those are things that you can only predicate of a person. And the danger of coming to believe in God as a force is simply this. We use forces because we're superior to them as persons. And how dangerous is it for someone to get 
into their heads the idea that God is a force that you can use. He isn't. It's for him to use us, not for us to use him. So Genesis begins to be a corrective to false ideas of the nature of God. You notice that God created, but he's distinct from his creation. It isn't an emanation from him. He spoke and it was. And there are so many of these things. I'm only going to leave you with two. And the first is this. The thing that is repeated again and again is, and God said, and God said, and God said. Whatever you think about the days, there's a sequence of statements by God. Now that's very important. Because what it's telling us is that this universe, this cosmos, is not a closed system of cause and effect. God spoke into it, so to speak, from the outside, and things happened. May I point out to you that that's the exact opposite of an unguided natural process? And it gets even more interesting if you notice that on two of those days, God speaks more than once. On day three and day six. On day three, the differentiation is between matter, inanimate matter, and life. You don't get in scripture from inanimate matter to life without, and God said. It doesn't happen through an unguided natural process. And on day six, it's animals and human beings. You don't get from animals to human beings without, and God said. It's not an unguided natural process. It's almost as if the chapter anticipates the contemporary debate, doesn't it? Now, these are very challenging things coming up to us from the ancient world. And I say the question again, how did they know this? Because we have lived, and our generation really is the first, my generation I mean, to realize that this notion of God speaking, the logos, the word, is fundamental to human life. It's fundamental to physics, by the way, as well. But we know that each of the 10 trillion cells in our bodies has got a copy of the longest word ever discovered, is the DNA code. Word-based life. In the beginning was the word. And the big problem that faces my biological colleagues is this. Where do you get the information from that's coded on DNA? You see, and I'm cutting a very long story short. We have taught at school often that all explanation goes from the simple to the complex. And the ideal explanation is this. That you take a complex thing and you explain it in terms of simpler things. That's wonderful when it works, and it often does. There's one area it doesn't work, and that's where language is concerned. The moment you see something written, even if it's as short as your name written on the beach at Port Rush, if there's still a beach there, you immediately infer that there's been an intelligence at work, don't you? You haven't seen it written, but you know because it instantly has meaning for you that an intelligence has been at work. And I sometimes tease my colleagues in Oxford, my colleagues, when the conversation gets dull, which is very rare. But I point this out to them, and then I say, you go into the lab, and you look at DNA, and it's a word with three and a half billion letters in it, in exactly the right order. And I say to you, where does that come from? And you say, chance and the laws of nature. You see your own name, five letters long on a page, and I say, where does that come from? And they say, intelligence. Why the difference? I don't see a reason why. You see, ladies and gentlemen, the Bible claims that God is evident in his creation. And if emphasis is anything to go by, what Genesis is calling to us is to pay attention to information, word, and almost every single statement about creation in the whole of scripture is like that. By faith we understand that the worlds were made by the word of God. Where did the laws of nature come from? We encode them in mathematical language, in mathematical words. It's another evidence of God who is the word. Because the one thing you cannot do is generate words and language from nothing. 
Or even if you've got some molecules and material, you can't generate them by unguided natural processes. The only place where words come from is mind. And every analogy we know runs in that direction. So it seems to me that and God said, and God said, is unpacking what John 1 says, in the beginning was the word, and is utterly profound. And it accords with all I know of science. Because you see, I've lived to see people change their minds. Many leading people now realize, and some of them are leading atheists like Thomas Nagel, that you can't reduce language and word and meaning to molecules. And they're suggesting as atheists that there's something fundamentally wrong with the materialism that does so. Well, that's the end of it as far as I'm concerned. Science and the universe are not neutral. They're pointing towards a creative world. Now, my final point is this, and I wish I had a lot of time to spend on this, because it's more important in a way than everything else. And God said, and God said, and God said. There's a sequence leading to a climax. It's not a sequence of unguided natural processes. It's the exact opposite. And the culmination of it is, and God said, let us make man in our own image. Male and female, he created them. The universe is wonderful, ladies and gentlemen, but it wasn't made in the image of God. You were. Have you ever thought about that? How important is a human being? You look up at the vastness of the universe, and I have a telescope, and I love looking at the galaxies and see Andromeda with its billions of stars, and I'm so tiny. But then is size the measure of importance? It shows the glory of God. It doesn't even know I exist. I know it exists. That means, you see, if it's right. This is telling you something about yourself. It's saying that you are uniquely made in the image of God. The universe isn't. It shows his glory. And we would want to unpack that, wouldn't we? Because this is the foundation, up until relatively recently, of our morals and ethics, isn't it? In our Western world, our value system is based on the Bible. That is now being rapidly undermined. And it's being undermined by the bioethicists led by Peter Singer, who suggests to us that we're just one species among many others, not particularly important, and perhaps far too many of us anyway. Is that the solution? When what scripture says at the very beginning is that human beings are made in the image of God and that gives to each one of us an infinite value. I say again, even leading atheists like Jürgen Habermas on the continent says, look, we need to be careful. He's an atheist, what we do with religion. Because he says, our Western concepts of human rights, of egalitarianism, all come from the Judeo-Christian heritage. And he even adds, he says, we've no other source. Everything else is just postmodern chatter. But the postmodern chatter has risen to such a crescendo that basing human values and then ethics on the uniqueness of humans as created in the image of God is being eroded in our colleges and universities as fast as it could possibly be. And you only have to teach a couple of generations of young people that they are merely animals until they start to realize it and behave like animals. Small wonder of what is happening to our society. I hope I've said enough to indicate to you that these texts are so important. Not simply for our understanding of the cosmos, but for our understanding of ourselves. Now, all I've got to so far these are only the little steps. I've been talking to you about your value as a created being in the image of God. There's a bigger value than that. Because the heart of the biblical story is that the God who created the universe and you in it became human. And by the way, 
If you want a powerful argument for the uniqueness of human beings, you might want to think about this. Are human beings special? Oh yes they are, because God became one. That's awesome. And because God became human in Jesus Christ and he died on the cross, those of us who trust him have an even bigger value. It's one thing for you to have unmeasurable value as a creature of God. All of you have that, whether you believe in him or not. Oh, but what a wonderful thing to discover. That Christ died for you. The most precious life in all of history was extinguished for you. God so loved the world that he gave his son. That's a much deeper value, isn't it? And you see, if the first story is credible, if our universe bears traces of having been created by the word, then it's a smaller step, isn't it, to begin to take seriously the central claim of the Christian faith, that the word became human and has provided the means for you to get to know the word who created the universe. But that's a story for another time. Thank you very much. I'm going to collect a number of questions because in an audience like this, everybody's interested in everybody else's question. So what we're going to do, I'm going to get some idea, and so are you, of the spectrum of questions that are in the room. Now, the rules are simple. Keep them on this topic. I'm not here to deal with all the other cultural and biblical topics around the place. We're talking about points of origin and what I've been saying. Secondly, this is not the place for statements. The time you take for your question is time taken away from the next person. So we're going to try and get as many as possible. Thirdly, if you've got a question, ask it now. I am not going to be available afterwards. Uh, often it happens, we get several questions, and then I go to the door, and I'm overwhelmed with dozens of questions. Your chance is now. This is the third major session I've had today, so I think I've earned a rest. So if you don't ask it now, don't ask it afterwards. So off we go. Put up your hand, and Mike will get to you, and I will write your question down, and then we'll move on like that. Okay. Hi, uh, what do you make of Tom Wright's proposal on Adam and Eve, that they were a chosen couple out of a sort of selection of humans in the way that Israel was a chosen nation? How does that, you know, factor into your special creation? Adam and Eve selected, the idea that they were selected out of a group of Neanderthals or something like that. Is that it? Generally? Okay. Sorry. You briefly uh, speak about the um, pantheistic uh, worldview at the start of your talk. Um, how do you approach um, in, in a society where increasingly pantheism, other gods, um, uh, uh, is, is being a, a, is a, is a welcomed ideology? And how as Christians are we to res respond to that? Response to pantheism. Um, you, you referred a couple of times to St. John's Gospel. And the beginning of St. John's Gospel, you know, it says, and the word was made flesh. It uses the word word on a number of occasions. It's always struck me as an odd word to use. So is there significance in the word word in, in your view? And if so, what is that significance? Thank you. Okay, four. Why do you think the atheists get away with such um, bad logic? And, you know, just why do atheists that? get away with such bad logic? <laughs> because we let them. <laughs> okay. Thank Good, you. we're going fast. Yeah, you had mentioned at the start that many scientists say things that aren't scientific. Uh, how would you define science then? What would you define as the remit of science? Okay. How to define science? Go ahead. I'm not sure if I'm stepping on the pantheism question, but how do you know it was the Christian God that created the universe and it's not like, Allah or one of the other gods? Okay. okay. How do you know it's the Christian God and not say Allah and so on. Okay. Okay. So I just wondered, given the advantages that the Christian worldview has from an existential perspective, so, you know, the existence of right and wrong, there's an ultimate purpose. 
What do you think has led atheism to gain ground in the way that it has, given that it offers no ultimate purpose and, and no ultimate hope or, or right or wrong? Okay, good question. Right, is there another urgent one? Because, is that it? Oh, there's a lady there. Yes, please. Um, we've moved from um, concordism to con How do we revert and how do congregations faithfully challenge um, that which is untrue? Okay, thank you very much. We'll have a look at these. I'm going to take the last one first. How do we move from conflict to concordism? By exploding the conflict myth. And it's a very sad thing. I hadn't time to introduce it at the beginning. The general impression in the UK is that science here, theology here, they'll never meet. And there's a real warfare between science and belief in God. I don't think there is. And I think you can demonstrate that relatively easily. And I find it helpful to point out to people that last year's Physics Nobel Prize was won by Peter Higgs. He's an atheist. And um, the prize a few years before that was run by Bill, won by Bill Phillips, who's a Christian. Now, if you win the Nobel Prize in Physics, you're pretty bright. So that what distinguishes Bill Phillips from Peter Higgs is not their science. They both won the Nobel Prize. What distinguishes them is their worldview. One's a theist and the other's an atheist. Now, I analyze your question this way. The conflict is real, but it's not between science and God. It's between two worldviews, particularly in this country. That is the worldview of atheism and the worldview of Christian theism. There's where the conflict is. And science claims both sides. Dawkins claims science points to atheism. I claim the exact opposite. So the real question to ask is, which way does science point? That's the proper question. But we need to get rid of the conflict myth. The difficulty in getting rid of it, though, is that there are two iconic things in history that keep it going. One is Galileo and his um, entretemps with the contretemps with the Catholic Church. The other is um, Huxley and Wilberforce. Now, I haven't time to go into those in detail. I've written about them in my book, God's Undertaker. It's enough to say this. That scholars now dismiss those stories in the sense not that they didn't happen, but that their interpretation is completely false. They cannot be used as evidences of a conflict between science and religion. Just let me say briefly about Galileo. The sort of myth is here he was, um, and he was a genuine scientist bringing the truth to the world, and he was first opposed by the church who were obscurantists and they believed the Bible and then they persecuted him and all the rest of it. Well, he wasn't first opposed by the church at all. He was first opposed by the philosophers. Why? Because he was challenging the reigning paradigm of the day, which was Aristotelianism, which believed the earth didn't move. And he was challenging that. The church jumped on that bandwagon because they thought that scripture taught the same thing. But it's very important to realize that it wasn't a conflict between science and religion at all. It was a conflict between two interpretations of the data. And oddly enough, Galileo wasn't an atheist either, was he? It was a man who believed the Bible who turned out to be right. So the confusion about that iconic story is just wrong. And if you want to read more about it, my colleague at Oxford, or who was at Oxford, with whom I worked, John Hedley Brook, our first professor of science and religion, has written a great deal about it. So much so that the general consensus now is this. These stories, far from establishing the conflict myth, the real question is how they possibly managed to sustain the myth for so long. So... Conflict is something written into the genes of many people, but I believe it's completely false. It's asking the wrong question. Now, the next thing is, um, let's have a look. Um, there were two questions about atheism. Why do they get away with bad logic? And why does atheism gain ground? Well, people get away from bad logic because... Unfortunately, whether we like it or not, 
If you're a scientist and you're a prestigious person, you have an authority. And people get away with it by making statements. You know, for instance, uh, Stephen Hawking was asked what he thought of religion. And he says religion is a fairy story for people afraid of the dark. And because he's a scientist, everybody bows to it. But that's not a statement of science. And I ought to tell you, oughtn't I, that when I was asked the same question, I said atheism was a fairy story for people afraid of the light. <laughs> well, you, you know, that proves nothing. Absolutely nothing. But it's easy to make these wild statements. And people do it all the time, and we let them get away with it. They'll show you a magnificent picture of the universe, talk to you about a few equations, and say there's no God. There's no logic in it, there's no argument in it, there's just beautiful photography and wild assertion. Why does it gain ground? Because a lot of people want to hear that there's no God. <laughs> because the issue of God, ladies and gentlemen, let me make the point again, God is not a theory, he's a person. And if God is not simply at the back of our universe, but as at the back of our morality, the very mention of God will raise moral questions in people's minds. I mean, I often ask myself, why are people so frightened of a God that it doesn't exist? Because the very mention of God somehow makes people think of the transcendent, of responsibility about the way they're behaving. And some are very honest, like Thomas Nagel I mentioned before, he said, I don't want there to be a God. That's not science, that's just personal preference. I do not want there to be a God, but it's honest, it's very honest. And of course, atheism grains ground because many people have had such a negative experience of Christianity. This is shameful, isn't it? A friend of mine in the United States thought he'd write to all the students who ran humanist, secularist, atheist groups in colleges and universities in the States. And he said, I'd love to hear your story. I'm not going to tell you mine, I'm just interested in your story. Do you know what he found? Every single one of them had started in a Christian background, everyone. That's shameful, isn't it? Why does that happen? Well, the biggest reason given in Britain for leaving the church is simple. They don't answer our questions. They live in a ghetto, they talk a language that we don't understand, they don't answer our questions. And we go on like that and we lose a generation. And this is very important, ladies and gentlemen. Ground is gained because there's no credible alternative. And it's no use us simply preaching and teaching and explaining. We've got to live consistently with what we preach or nobody will listen to us. And that's an enormous challenge to me and it's an enormous challenge to you. And there are many young people here. If you're going to influence the world, you need to make some very serious decisions. And one of them is how you spend your time. Just go home and write down how many times, how much time you spent in the last week watching a screen and playing games. And write down beside it how much time you spent in prayer and studying scripture. And then you'll know why we're failing to reach the world. We're playing at religion, ladies and gentlemen. And there's so much destruction. Now, I'm not a fuddy-duddy. I use the technology. I'm grateful for my website. But I watch and see that we're damaging our attention spans by our concentration, not simply on one instrument, but several at once. And even the psychologists are coming in and telling us we're rewiring our brains by doing it. We need to get real about this. And that's why we're driving people into atheism. They're looking for questions. They're looking for reality. But if we spend all our time tweeting and texting, we won't have time to get to know people at any depth. How many people have said to me, I've got hundreds of Facebook friends, I've no real friends. We ought to learn from that, oughtn't we? We're amusing ourselves to death. And as Christians, we need to wake up and take it seriously. I'm glad people told me that when I was your age. And if you make up your minds tonight, and do something about it, you can change the world, you can change this country. But I'm starting to preach, so I better go back to the questions. <laughs> now, how do I define science with great difficulty, but I'm glad I'm in very good company. 
Defining science is a very difficult thing. People used to think they could define science. But as Augustine said about time, everybody knows what time is until we try to define it. That doesn't mean we can get no idea of what science is. But the experts in the philosophy of science have long since given up trying to give a watertight definition of science. Of course, they will talk about various methodologies that we think of as scientific, testing hypotheses, repeating experiment, and all this kind of thing. That is, they become a little bit more modest. The, the reason for that is that they've realized that science is not something out there that's dispassionate and completely objective, but it is something done by people. And people have their worldviews, they have their predispositions, they have their prejudices that they bring to bear. So when I said not every statement by a scientist is a statement of science, what I was meaning more precisely was not trying to beg the question of how we define science. It's when people move outside their realm. Let me give a glaring instance of it. Carl Sagan, at the beginning of his famous book, Cosmos, TV series in America. The universe is all that is, was, or ever shall be. That's a statement about a cosmos by a scientist, but it's a statement of his own belief system. It's a philosophical statement in that sense. It's not a scientific statement, because however you define science, it can't prove to you that the cosmos is all that there is, was, or ever shall be. That's all that I meant by that. But read any book on the definition of science. What is science, for instance, which is a very popular one, and you see how difficult it is. Now, somebody said this. Um, what about the word logos? Isn't it an odd word? I don't think so, actually. It's an immensely powerful word because it was already in existence at the time that John wrote his gospel. And it was used by the Stoic philosophers to describe what they believe to be a rational principle, a reason behind the universe. Now, the insight was brilliant. It wasn't enough. So what John does is use that word, but give it much more depth in terms of its meaning and connotation. In itself, it is ideas of word, command, speech, logic, and we get all those concepts from it. But John pointed out that this is the God that created the universe. A person, a triune person who has a fellowship. He indicates that at the beginning. The word was with God and the word was God. That boggles the minds immediately. How can God be with God? Well, only if God is very complex and is a fellowship rather than a single monolithic person. So I think the word is wonderful because it's full of these big suggestions of ideas, but is telling us that the universe is intelligence-based and rational. That's the exact opposite of the claim of my atheist friends. They try to get rationality out of irrationality, and they can't, of course. So volumes have been written on logos, so you better read some serious theologians and see what they make of it. But I find it a most useful concept because the physicists now are saying information, however you define it, and that's difficult too, is fundamental to our universe and cannot be reduced to physics and chemistry. And it's those developments I find very exciting. Now, how do I respond to pantheism? That is a topic for an evening, sir. And I, what I would recommend to you to do is what I have done, and that is to read a little book called The Universe Next Door by a man called James Sire. And if you get it in a second edition, it is very helpful in enabling you to respond to pantheism. After all, if I say, how do you respond to uh, atheism? I have to spend a lot of time spelling that out, and you just can't do that in the Q&A. So that's a desperately unsatisfactory answer. But for the rest of you, if you've never read G James Sire's book on worldviews, it's very worthwhile reading because it'll introduce you to a way of thinking that will help you communicate. He wrote it in light of experience with generation after generation of students and helping them to articulate their faith. So his response to pantheism is one of the most interesting that I have found. Two more questions uh, left. Um, one was Tom Wright, Adam and Eve, 
Are they um, a pair of Neanderthals uh, on whom God, to whom God gives his spirit? Now, I haven't read Tom Wright on this, so let's leave Tom Wright aside. I'm very familiar with the, the view. And it is a very common view. And I'm going to be very controversial right now. So if you don't like controversy, leave. Okay? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, what's at stake in all of this? is the question of continuity and discontinuity. As we look at biological life, animal life, human life, is it a continuous tree of ascent from the simplest kind of life to human life with no input from outside the system? That is the big issue. Now, if you take the view of many of my atheist friends by definition, you regard that as the only possible option because you do not believe that the universe is an open system. It's a closed system of cause and effect. There is no supernatural. So there's got to be a continuum. Now, of course, believing in the supernatural doesn't necessitate that there can't be a continuum, but it opens up a bigger possibility. Now, I believe that there was a singularity, a point where the laws of nature break down at the beginning of the universe. Most atheists believe that too, and most Christians. I believe that behind that singularity was God. They believe that behind it was nothing. Secondly, if we're Christian, we believe in a massive singularity when God entered the world. The word became human. That's not to be explained in terms of natural processes going on just before it happened. I believe in another very big singularity when Jesus rose from the dead and when he ascended. Now the big question is, are there any more? Are there any connected with the origin of life, just to name two, and the origin of human life? And these ideas that there was a pool, they've got it down from millions to thousands and they're getting it lower and lower. I'm not sure myself, perhaps I don't understand the argument very well why it can't be two. But a pool of hominids that are ascended, so to speak, by purely unguided natural processes from lower forms of life. Well, I must state my position. A, I'm not a biologist. B, I read a lot of biology. And I'm not convinced. In fact, I'm more and more convinced as I read the biologists that many things claimed of evolution are what my atheist friends claim about God, a God of the gaps. There's an evolution of the gaps. How did it happen? Evolution did it. Give me a mechanism. There isn't one. That's an evolution of the gaps. And one of the world's leading authorities of the origin of life, Robert Lachlan, said he's utterly fed up with evolution being used as an anti-theory. That is an excuse for not doing solid science. This is a Nobel Prize winner who's not a Christian. He says, you claim your mess of proteins became a chicken. Evolution did it. That's an empty statement because you've no mechanism that does it. Now, when I find the biologist, and this is a very long story, and I can't authenticate this tonight, but you're going to have a little look at my website and other websites, I get more and more alarmed at claims that are being made for unguided natural processes. But let me come at this from a biblical point of view. You see, I have more options than many of my biology friends. Why? Because I believe the universe is not a closed system. Now, in 1953, an experiment was done which won the Nobel Prize, and Miller and Urey thought they'd discovered the secret of life. That was 1953. This is 2014. The situation is now infinitely more difficult than it was then. Why? Because we've discovered life has a digital, semiotic base, an information-rich macromolecule of DNA. And nobody's coming up with any ideas of how you get information from matter and energy. Now that's exactly what I would expect to find if the Bible is right. Let me put it this way. I believe that there are bad gaps and good gaps. 
Bad gaps are like electricity and lightning. They're closed by science. The good gaps are open by science. And if you're not open to the possibility of an input from outside the system, so you're trying to get the rational from the non-rational, meaning from non-meaning, and you run into difficulty, it's just possible that you're using the wrong tools, that you're refusing to admit that mind may be, uh, have been involved. And so the longer it goes on, the more evidence I think there is that mind was involved in the beginning was the word. Secondly, when it comes to human beings, let me tell you about the Genesis story briefly. What does it say? Well, it says that God made humans of the dust of the earth. Hebrew language would have found it very easy to say that God made human beings out of pre-existent animals. But it chooses not to. So it's making a very bad job of it if the fact is that human beings are descended from animals indirectly. That's point number one. Point number two, it gets even more interesting when we come to the origin of women. Remember the biblical story, ladies? It's very interesting, isn't it? It's almost humorous. Because what it says is, it is not good for man to be alone. And then it talks about the animals, and, and God told man to name all the animals. So what was all that about? Well, God said, I will make a help answering to him. And he got him to name all the animals. And after that very lengthy process of taxonomy, which is the beginning of biology, so it tells us the Bible is pro-science and not against it, it says, but for Adam, there was no creature found answering to him. Where? Among the animals. Isn't it interesting that according to the Bible, the very first lesson that humans were taught is that they're utterly distinct from animals. Well, if that's a way of telling us that human beings were made from pre-existent animals, it's doing a very much worse job. But it's worse than that. The story tells us that God put Adam to sleep and made a woman out of him. What do you do with that, ladies and gentlemen? What do you do with that? Because that cannot, by any stretch of the imagination, be an attempt to tell you they were made for the animals because the text explicitly says the animals didn't fit. So what do I believe? What it says. It's a discontinuity. It's a direct input by God. What can science say about that? Nothing. Let me give you a little illustration to get this across. Suppose my brother here at the front and I were biologists. And we're worried about the lack of good wheat in the earth. And we in our laboratory with our intelligence managed to genetically engineer to produce a wonderful strain of wheat that feeds the world. Our research is lost. 5,000 years later, scientists in the lab are looking at this wheat and saying, now, where did this wheat come from? They're all Darwinians. They will fit it into a Darwinian paradigm, but we'll know it doesn't. It was genetically engineered by human intelligence, but that's invisible to a Darwinian paradigm, isn't it? And you see, what I observe around me is this. I'm open to wider possibilities that don't contradict any science because they're saying that God made a direct input just as he did at the creation and as he did at the conception of Jesus and at the resurrection of Jesus and his ascension. Of course, God can do it any way he likes. The question is, what way did he do it? And I'm more concerned about getting behind these views and saying, is the is the thrust behind them actually to try and argue that it's a continuous naturalistic process? Because I notice that some of the leading people in the world who believe this, the view that was put to me a moment or two ago, they still believe that God said something special to these animals and gave them his spirit. So they believe in a supernatural intervention. What then is the in principle problem of believing that it was more than that? I'm not sure that there is one. But that's very controversial. So let me end with the final question. And it's 
How do you know it's a Christian God? Well, not from studying the universe. Except to the extent that the Christian God is revealed in Scripture, and the more I find Scripture making sense of the universe and vice versa, the more I am inclined to believe that the Judeo-Christian understanding is correct. But this is a very legitimate question. Because if we simply talk about the universe, Paul will tell you. He will say, look, you look at the universe, you can see something. What can you see? Well, the invisible things of God are revealed in the things that are made. What things? His power and Godhead. You can see there is a God, but he's powerful. You cannot deduce the essential doctrines of Christianity from observing the stars or biological nature or anything like that. So where do you get that from? Why the Christian God? Because there are other sources of evidence, of course. You see, I was asked to talk about Genesis, but there's the rest of the Bible tacked on behind it. And of course, as the big meta-narrative of the Bible goes through, it tells us that the God who created the universe became human. And now the evidence becomes not in terms of science, but in terms of history and human experience. And the reason I believe that it's the God of the Bible, the Christian God as you call it, but there is only one God, is because of the evidence of those deeper things those historical specifics like the resurrection of Jesus and his ascension and so on. That's why. Now, let me illustrate that. You mentioned Islam. Let's take the three monotheistic religions that we are very familiar with, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. How do you decide? Well, I know no other way of deciding these things than on the basis of the evidence. What's the evidence? Well, let's take the central claim. I have many Jewish friends, they believe that Jesus died, he didn't rise. I have many Muslim friends, they believe that Jesus didn't die. And they have no problem in saying this in public. It's only the atheists get worried about discussions of other religions. I don't know anybody in the other religions that get too worried about them. I believe that Jesus... Those three views cannot be simultaneously correct, can they? Logic tells you that. So you have to decide. How do you decide? On the basis of the evidence. Is there evidence that Jesus died? Is there evidence that he rose again? And because this matter of evidence is crucial, I wrote my last book, Gunning for God. You may be able to get it outside. And I devote the last two chapters in it to, one, the in principle question of miracle, and then the second question is, did Jesus actually rise from the dead? Because that for me is crucial. That's what the apostles announced to the ancient world. That's what Christia got Christianity going. So you're quite right and legitimately asked the question. You can't decide it on the things I said at the beginning of the talk. You have to adduce more evidence, but the evidence is available. And of course the final bit of evidence is the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Jesus makes claims about you and me. He tells you and me that if we're prepared to be honest about the mess we've made of life and all that muck and stuff we've produced and repent of it and trust Christ, he will forgive us and bring us peace with God and transform our lives. You can test that. He can heal a marriage. I've seen it happen so many times. He can bring healing to the brokenhearted. I must be honest, I haven't seen atheism do this as effectively. And so in the end, the test is this. Does it actually work? All of us need to be loved. All of us need to be forgiven and accepted. Well, Jesus claims we can be if we trust him. And you see, ladies and gentlemen, this is where skepticism stops. I'm a skeptic. Skepticism means check it out from a distance. And you're very wise to do, check things out from a distance. But if you want to get to know me, you'll have to give up your distance, won't you? You'll have to reveal yourself to me, and I'll have to reveal yourself to you. And in the last analysis, this is the most important thing of all. That if Jesus is raised from the dead, he's alive today. You can get to know him. How do you get to know him? By opening your heart and mind to that possibility. 
If I told you, young men, that there's a red Ferrari outside the door waiting for you, you could sit from now to next year and argue with me philosophically that there can't be, etc. You'd never know until you go and look, would you? And it's the same with this. In the end, you've got to give up your distance. You've got to go and look. And if you've never, as an adult, seriously read the scripture, start with the Gospel of John and ask your questions, and you get answers. You see, the faith in God that I possess is not some wishy-washy intellectual suicide. It's based on evidence. Otherwise, you'd be a complete fool. And that's why I'm confident. Not because of me, but because of the God who's provided that evidence. But we must stop and we must go home, so thank you very much indeed.